Hi, hi, I'm Trinity with Revolution LA, Divest LA, Public Bank LA. And I'm Phoenix. And uh, I'll start off by giving an intro about who we are, um, how we started, uh, how we started Divest LA, and how that segued into now Public Bank LA. So Revolution LA is a grassroots political organization. Uh, it's mostly millennial led, and we've been around for about three years now. We started, uh, we created a 13-point uh, human rights-based agenda. Uh, about two years ago, and through the last few years, we've been working on trying to educate and mobilize a new generation of action, uh, of revolutionaries and activists in, in Los Angeles. And um, around the first of the year, we created a three-point agenda. We narrowed that 13-point agenda down to three-point agenda. And that three-point agenda was focused on creating uh, community-led and community-based initiatives that would focus on addressing big macro issues. And so we narrowed that list down to three points and the three points number one was creating divestment on an individual level number two was 100 percent green energy to push los angeles to commit 100 percent to being 100 percent green and number three on that list was getting money out of politics so uh it was about a few weeks after we had our launch meeting for the three-point agenda three-point people and planet over profit-based agenda. Um, Kashama Sawant led the, uh, led the movement in Seattle to divest $3 billion out of Wells Fargo for their long history of fraud and corruption, for their funding of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, so inspired by, by what Kashama Sawant did, inspired by the indigenous struggles that was going on at Standing Rock, um, we in Los Angeles you know, knew that we had to immediately jump in and and you know, kind of capture this momentum, um, learn about you know how you know how Seattle did that. You know, kind of we what we did was we started you know kind of dissecting their their legislative steps towards getting that three billion dollars out of Wells Fargo. So we jumped into strategic mode. We created a legislative arm, we uh, the legislative and policy arm. We created a uh, a media arm. Um, a, uh, an events and protest arm, as well as a, uh, the third is the protest, media, social media, uh, legislation and policy, and um, the, one, <laughs> yeah, the fourth one, uh, so, research. We're, and well, research as well. So we went through, we looked at what Kashama Sawan did, um, we started looking at the legislative process of Los Angeles because at that time we were relatively new at it. So, you know, we looked at the who our likely allies were, who our likely opponents were, what banking contracts we had to look at. So in in Seattle, they had they had to uh, completely revise a. a create a new socially responsible banking ordinance. In Los Angeles, it's called the RBO, which is the Responsible Banking Ordinance. So, so, that, so what we ended up doing was create, we created our own motion. Um, we realized that Los Angeles' current RBO was quite weak. Um, that was the RBO that was uh, introduced in 2012. And um, so we understood that in order for us to create any real, uh, you know, impactful change as far as the financial system went in Los Angeles, we had to actually go in and, and create a, a real socially and environmentally responsible framework to the existing banking contracts. So our legislative team, um, within the past few months, we've created a our own draft of the the, the divestment motion, the our own draft of the responsible banking ordinance. Uh, we also actually took a step further and created a, a draft for the the request for proposal, the RFP, with any bank that banks with the city of Los Angeles has to submit, has to go through this RFP process in order to, to, to assume the city's financial contracts. So we created a, a draft for the RFP as well as the RIO, which is the Responsible Investment Ordinance that we wanted to create to help guide the city's investments. Because um, ultimately, you know, our city invests in Chevron, Exxon Mobil, um, as well as, uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, you know, you name it. You know, we have a, a long list of, of, of really ethical, unethical investments. And ultimately, you know, banks guide, uh, uh, banks control the funding for wars. They finance wars, they finance private prisons, they finance destructive environmental projects. So by virtue of having our city's funds 
in these 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 corporations, you know, we're we're effectively or essentially, you know, complicit to these these crimes. And so we want our city, you know, it's 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 quite a simple ask. We want our public funds to sit in ethical banking institutions. We want our public funds to help fund renewable energy projects, to help fund education infrastructure. You know, that's 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 quite quite the you know the simple argument that we have. And so, but we understood it was much more comprehensive process. Process. So we had to go in and build alliances with council members, and we did multiple rounds of not only phone banking but citizens lobbying. Where we sat down, we had to educate our supporters on the talking points because you know yes, this started in Standing Rock, and you know that was initially was was quite you know that there was a strong visceral uh, push by by a lot of activists you know, to, to get banks to divest because of their funding of Dapple, but ultimately big banks affect every single one of our lives. And so we had to educate people, our supporters, on what, you know, what they what needed to be in an RFP, what needed to be in an RIO and an RBO. And so, you know, we had to write down and list all of what, you know, what we believed the, you know, the socially and environmental responsible framework for a city's banking contracts should look like, and so we had to go in and help inspire even the, our even the city council members because you know, at the end of the day, <coughs> these are politicians and sometimes their vision is quite narrow, and so <laughs> they require the public, and you know we they were surprisingly very receptive at the end of the day. I mean, at first we came in quite strong because we started doing something called co-occupations. Whereas the Occupy movement was about a lot of noise making on the periphery, like outside of City Hall, we wanted to come in, sit down, and have a conversation with, with, with our, our elected policymakers. And so that's why we called it co-occupations. We started, uh, we, we filled up public comments and talked directly to them about what we wanted in the RBO and what we wanted in, in all of these financial contracts. We did citizens lobbying. And uh, you know that was great because we started building alliances, and we, they didn't see us, you know, as 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 you know, some rogue outsiders. We we're here, you know, quite literally trying to write the rules, rewrite the rules, and rather than having Wall Street write the rules. So you know, at the at, at by the end of June, um, the divestment motion was voted on, and it passed unanimously uh, by all by all council members. Um, and so the city has. You know, now begun the process to divest at least forty million dollars in Wells Fargo Holdings, but that's forty million out of a bigger pot of billions. And so, right now we're going into phase two of divest LA, and you know it's going to be a big fight because that forty million is is chunk change, and um, the billions is is what we're going after. And and you know we're talking about a city that's you know one of the most powerful city councils in the country, uh, the LA Chamber of Commerce. You know, which finances some of these uh, city council members' campaign is backed by. You know, on that board sits the uh, uh, members of Chevron, uh, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo. So you know, we this is in phase two. You know, we we really need to activate you know, city, all all citizens in Los Angeles. Uh, we're working with neighborhood councils right now. You know, as many of you know, there are over ninety six there are ninety six neighborhood councils in Los Angeles representing about 40,000 resident stakeholders to get their involvement in this, to get big political groups, feel the Burn Democratic uh, Club, the chapters just voted to support Divest LA, and they're submitting a community impact statement. So, you know, we're, we're really mobilizing right now to get all its citizens in Los Angeles on board because this ultimately impacts all of our lives. Um, so that's where Divest LA is right now. The divestment report just came out a week ago. Um, so we're now still going through it. Um, at the, some, of you, some of you guys were at the divestment hearing at the end of June. And, and of course, you saw you know, the CEO of Wells Fargo lobbyists sitting there trying to combat our little progressive uh, grassroots movement. And so we're expecting a big fight for round two because it, they were obviously organized going in, but we were more organized, and so that's what it's going to take. It's just to overpower. If they can't overpower us with their numbers, we, we just have to come in more organized and even, you know, even, even more intelligent about how we approach the legislative process. And so going in phase two, uh, we're, gonna, we're going through the divestment report right now. Um, you know, there are a few things in there that, that are concerning. They, you know, favorably talk about Wells Fargo's return of investments. 
um, and their liquidity. So there's language in there that's trying to kind of give them a little bit of more leeway. Um, they're, you know, one of the big points that we were advocating for was obviously social responsibility and and that's still very vague in the report. Um, so that's something that we're going to have to go in and, uh, you know, obviously lobby pretty hard on. Uh, but, uh, you know, right now it's, it, it's, it's an exciting moment because all of the divestment movements that are going across the country from, you know, from Seattle to Davis to San Francisco to Oakland to Los Angeles, New York, Massachusetts, Washington, D.C. So all of these divestment movements are now segueing to public banking movements because, you know, as all of these cities are looking at where do you put this money, where do you move these billion dollar, you know, billions of dollars out because, what other big bank is as considered ethical? None. So all of these divestment movements that are springing up across the country are now, you know, being mobilized into public banking movements. So that's it's where we're really in an opportune time right now in history for this to happen. And uh, we just had our Public Bank LA launch meeting uh, a month ago, and uh, Ellen Brown, the founder of Public Banking Institute, is uh, is has joined our our. Uh, Public Bank LA as a board member, as, and she was there uh, at, at our meeting to speak, um, as well as Mark Armstrong of, of Commonomics. So, you know, it's really exciting to see, um, you know, all of these big allies and, and all of these cities are now working together to try to really take down and revolutionize the banking industry. So, you know, we're very excited to be a part of it. And I'll pass it over to Phoenix, as he's got, you know, he's going to go into that more. He's got a speech to prepare for that. So thank yes. you very much for having us. So, I wrote, I, I know you gave us a fairly generous amount of time, so I did write a uh, speech down to get uh, to go over everything from A to Z of uh, what the vision is and, and, and how we've been going about it. I did want to preface it with something that was brought up earlier in your discussion, which, uh, which I'd like to also you know, segue into what I, what this speech, is, was Andrea had, uh, had brought up the idea or the concept of the California uh, Investment Fund or uh, California uh, Infrastructure Bank, excuse me. Uh, what that is essentially is something called a revolving loan fund. So for example, if I were to give you $10 and you loan that $10 back out, that's what a revolving loan fund is. It's not a bank. Some of you may know that the way a bank works is it has a you know certain amount of liquidity on hand and then it can lend out 10 times that amount. It actually creates money out of kind of thin air based on a small amount of reserves. And that money is then used as kind of this energetic power that it creates investments you know, from there. So what that banking power of uh, reserve fund you know, loans um, and the ability to create that money is an extremely powerful tool. Um, that powerful tool is in private hands now, which is why this very uh, you know, strong ability to create money is used for all the things that I don't think anybody uh, here agrees with, like wars and pipelines and so forth. Um, because it's such a powerful tool by putting this in public hands and competent hands and altruistic hands that do it in the name of the people and in the name of the future of the human race and our, you, know, you know, the betterment of the common good, this powerful tool can be used uh, to leverage uh, itself towards these ends. Uh, now, to that end, uh, I'll go over you know, what I want to go over here, and I'm happy to answer any questions from there. So public banking is an idea whose time has come, um, and I'm here today to promote this really radical idea that the circulatory system of the economy should be in public rather than in private hands, uh, serving, to use the words of Rousseau, the general will which is what's best for everybody in society, rather than the particular will, which is what's best for just a faction of the people at the expense of everybody else in society, which is exactly the way private banking works right now. Now, banking is actually at the heart of the entire economy. Uh, it really actually determines where the money flows and what's, and for better or for worse, uh, with such a vital public service in the hands of an oligarchic and extractive financial elite, uh, pernicious abuse of this power right now is the norm. Now, the public bank solution actually has the potential to fundamentally transform the nature of the 
economy and even the very notion of economics itself. Really to make it once and for all in the service of the people uh, instead of for and by financial elites. So what, what we're advocating here, make no mistake, is for essentially a, an entire revolution. Uh, imagine if this idea caught fire and if this spread to all 50 states and to all major cities across the U.S. So let's not sell ourselves short here. Uh, we have to strive for nothing less than a complete radical system overhaul. Uh, that definitively and decisively transfers the levers of control from oligarchs to the people, uh, from Wall Street to Main Street, essentially. Really, right now, too much is at stake for the human race in too little a time frame to settle for anything less than this radical level of an overhaul. So what I want to contribute here is uh, really an expansion on the notion uh, of a social economy through public banking introduce, and, and to introduce some new ideas into this concept. Um, so right now, the, the public bank revolution, we believe, can sweep the entire nation by a storm, state by state. Uh, and there's a key element to consider here for socially and environmentally responsible economics, which is actually the notion of scale. So all the incredible benefits of a state bank uh, have been eloquently discussed before. Many of you have probably heard the arguments of public banking. I know you were discussing it here earlier. Um, and public bank activists have been going over this for quite a while. Uh, but I, I'm actually here to open your mind to uh, an even smaller economic civic unit or economic and civic unit than the state or the nation, uh, which is what some might say the most fundamental economic and civic unit of them all, which is the city or the municipality. So the vision is this, is what if in addition to a national or California state bank, which we definitely should be pushing for, we also saw the proliferation of municipal public banks sweeping the nation, which were, would be banks owned and operated by the people of local communities. So I'll tell you a story first of how we came here, which Trinity touched upon, um, and how it led to what we're advocating for today. And that begins in November of 2015, uh, which is when something which was seemingly relatively minor but it had profound implications uh, happen, uh, which is when Seattle voted in a socialist city council member, Kashan Swan. Uh, she ran on progressive issues, as you probably all know, uh, like $15 an hour minimum wage, affordable housing, and, and the like. Now, when too many politicians, even at the local level, are ultimately status quo preserving establishment careerists, uh, as I'm sure you all here frust have frustratingly had to contend with uh, firsthand, uh, the entrance of a genuinely progressive visionary uh, into the corridors of actual legislative power really made a, prof uh, a profound shift because Council Member Sawant, with her out-of-the-box visionary way of thinking, did something radical, which was to propose that the city of Seattle divest from Wells Fargo uh, due to the investment of DAPL and their long history of uh, predatory lending and fraud and the like. Now, at the end of the day, city money is public money, right? So that means that we, the people, at the end of the day, are actually complicit in the crimes of the big banks because our tax dollars are actually used to give money to those big banks. So therefore, we're complicit in those crimes unless we demand that legislative change. Um, so the implications here of leveraging city power to to change you know, the mass divestment or to, to, uh, to create the mass divestment from unethical financial institutions are enormous. Uh, this is really only the beginning. And this is when our di uh, journey at Divest LA began. So we started off wanting to emulate the Seattle motion uh, to divest from Wells Fargo you know, as an act in solidarity with Standing Rock um, to encourage higher ethical standards for the placement of public deposits in better banks. Now, we were tasked, obviously, in this process with researching possible alternatives to Wells Fargo. We want to move out of Wells Fargo. Okay, well, where do we move the money into? Um, the penny finally dropped when we were 
implementing, they're doing this research here, trying to figure out where, the, where the, to put the money. Now, I had already at this point been a huge fan of Ellen Brown's work. Uh, she was the author of The Public Bank Solution, the book. Uh, I never considered the idea of a public bank on a scale as small as the city before. It's a very kind of new concept that's not very, uh, highly, highly discussed. Uh, it is discussed more for a national or state level, typically. But the municipal public bank solution evolved naturally out of the divestment movement. Because when you're dealing with divesting, the natural next question becomes, again, naturally, okay, well, where are you going to move the money to? This is the question we kept hearing over and over. And sure, of course, moving city money from extremely unethical, big, private Wall Street banks to somewhat less unethical, big, <laughs> private Wall Street banks is technically, a, technically an improvement, right? But isn't local self-determination the best of all possible worlds? So think about all the incredible benefits of public banking you've heard about uh, applied on a, on a local citywide municipal level. So as it stands today, Los Angeles and countless other cities have their financial services provided by immoral, privately owned banks guilty of countless crimes against the people and the environment. Instead, cities can develop public banks that are fine-tuned to the needs of the local community, providing not only a more ethical framework, but as we've already learned, a much more effective one. Now think about the domino effect that began with a single progressive city council member in a single city that coincided with a monumental new popular movement in the support of Standing Rock. If we learn from this trend, we can, what can we look towards moving forward? Now imagine the possibilities. What began as a movement simply centered on, on divesting from a bank for a single set of crimes now morphs and evolves into a nationwide revolution to change not just the symptoms of our sick system, but to change the entire system itself. Imagine progressive socialists, greens, etc., are voted into more and more city councils across the nation, following in the footsteps of Kashama Sawant. News reports come out one after the other after the other. Like for example, Los Angeles charters a public bank. People's Bank of Pittsburgh founded. San Francisco creates a municipal public bank, etc., etc., etc. And while the cities transform one by one, the states also do so, and the movement spreads virally. Now, for as long as as modern banking has been in effect, private banking's extractive nature has leached untold wealth from the economy into the hands of the vampire squid money manipulators. <laughs> now, isn't that a tragedy? But in a stroke, in the stroke of a, of a pen, literally hundreds of billions of dollars will start to funnel out of Wall Street, back into local communities. Now, the charters of these various banks across the nation will be different in some cases, but similar in other cases. They'll each be tailored to the unique needs of each individual community, but should all universally have an environmental and socially responsible charter in their makeup. With so many public banks across the nation and even the world, you can see not only customization to local needs, but also competition. That's the argument apologists for the other side give for the private sector. But by providing so many independent financial institutions in the public sector, we can see competition as well as innovation without the greed and the hubris. And we can see altruistic economic policies being implemented cost effectively. It also means that each bank operating autonomously in the interests of its 
own local community can operate in this system as quote unquote laboratories. So maybe for example, the municipal bank of one city boldly implements an innovative policy with great results and other cities are inspired to follow suit. This will fast track the evolution of a system as a whole, as it strives to perfect itself continuously. If this scenario does indeed happen, it will mark one of the, if not the most radical economic shifts in this nation's entire history. Make no mistake, the public banking movement is not just a tweak to this current system. It is quite literally a radical system evolution and revolution. Now revolution is not only about pitchforks in the streets. A proper revolution is about the effective implementation of radical and enlightened ideas. It's not enough to spew anger at bankers, and it's not enough to ask to regulate them within the confines of the current paradigm. And it's not enough to jail them, although that would be a good start. <laughs> Regulation and reformist tweaks play into the game on the status quo's terms. Let's not try to come up with new conclusions to the same old premises. It's time to change the premises themselves. By building this movement from the bottom up, we follow the advice of famed luminary R. Buckminster Fuller when he taught us that we will change the old system by building the new one. I truly believe now in a moment in history where the ecosystem destruction and wealth inequality are reaching fever pitch levels, that we're at the cusp of an era of nothing less than fundamental systemic overhaul of the entire economic model. Historians will probably see this coming shift as a transitory period on par with the industrial or even Neolithic revolutions because the important thing to realize here is that this is not only about the financial sector in a vacuum. It's about using the levers of public capital paired with enlightened progressive vision to transform everything about our economy from the inside out. Well, either we have a shift of that magnitude or we end up in a much more dystopian situation. So let's not kid ourselves now about the importance we need to place on this task at hand. One of my major influences in economics is E.F. Schumacher's manifesto, Small is Beautiful, which you might have heard of. He introduced me to the concept of Buddhist economics, as he put it, which is the importance of localism, people and planet-centered economics, and small-scale markets harnessed to the social good. Some common well-known ideas you all have heard of today, which were directly influenced by E.F. Schumacher, are the concept of fair trade products and the local food revolution, which has happened and all of us are probably interested in eating local food. That's part of what he inspired. So as I see it, E.F. Schumacher plus Ellen Brown's public banking solution equals the system of economics that's gonna save the world. So at the end of the day, public banking at all scales needs to be at the center of a whole new way of conducting markets. It's about being the center of a new economy that could never ever again lead to the level of destruction the old economy has given us. In this system, we the people are the shareholders and bankers are nothing more than public servants. Just like the military personnel whose duty fundamentally is serving their nation or community. So think about this as an example. What do you all think a top ranking general in the US Army makes? It's about $250,000 a year, right? To put this into perspective. Top-ranking general. Now, 
this job is, of course, deemed extremely important to the nation and carries with it a high level of prestige and a comfortable salary. But it is first and foremost, by definition, a career of duty and of service to nation, right? Now, can you imagine if generals of the army made tens of millions a year? How absurd and preposterous would that concept be? Now, this is how we have to start looking at banking. Banks provide a vital public service and the directors, the CEOs of public banks should be looked at as literally nothing more than public servants. Rewarded appropriately, but not excessively, and always accountable to the good of the people as a whole. Under this system, the formally infinite power of financial elites will be subordinated to the public good. Local, small-scale public banks put the people and the community in charge of capitalism in the markets, determining, uh, determining allocation of funds based on social and environmental principles first and foremost, making the people and the planet beneficiaries of the economy. Today we're facing the domination of huge multinational corporations, environmental destruction, a lack of local self-determination, large-scale banking, and a one-size-fits-all culture and economics run for the interests of economic elites rather than the common good. So the solution to this is localism. It's small-scale economics. It's local self-determination. It's new, bold, innovative ideas and economics that puts people and planet first and foremost. So now in the age of Trump, where Washington DC is more and more being seen as an inaccessible swamp of corruption, we're actually beginning to see a shift to city and state civics. By going small, down to the scale of the city, we actually have incredible advantages. City halls are right where people live. Council members are more accessible than senators and presidents. City governments are more closely ref reflect the cultures and unique needs of the community and the people. Passing legislation at City Hall is a much less daunting task than passing it in the Senate or the House. And yet, with the single stroke of a mayor's pen, billions of dollars and fundamental shifts can be moved and made especially in the large cosmopolitan city like Los Angeles and other large cosmopolitan cities. The city is the fundamental civic unit. The beginning of civilization was at the city state of Sumer, the first city in the world. The city is the location where people gather, see their neighbors, work, go to school and conduct all manners of life. It is the basic unit of an advanced community. All civic units, beyond cities themselves, are nothing more than a network of interconnected cities and in, in, uh, surrounding countryside. Now, two of the most inspired cultures in human history are the classical Greek Golden Age and the Italian Renaissance. These cultures were buzzing with advances in so many areas, and they each provided their citizens with a highly localized consciousness and identity. The Greek polis was the birthplace of democracy, which entitled citizens to gather in the town square and discuss policies that they could vote on. In this manner, civic engagement was built into the culture. Perhaps we're planting the seeds now today for a future renaissance, one in which people eat more local food, people's local cultures thrive and grow in unique ways, and the economy circulates money in a way that benefits the community itself by investing in green energy, a new deal, affordable housing, and we live in a system where no matter what familial background a child is born into, no matter what class they're born into, they will be part of a vibrant culture and economy that ensures an excellent, perfected education 
and opportunities to achieve self-actualization no matter what. Imagine this world and let's build it. So I urge you and your friends to start pushing to run for city council. Join the movement and push your city and state to develop a municipal public bank. Do all the other hard, radical things fit not only for true leaders, but for champions of the people. With your help, we'll make it happen. Thanks. Now, I'd like to add a little addendum to that, and then we'll do some questions from there. Because it's not enough to create a public bank. You could have a public bank that's infiltrated by, by corrupt people. You could have a public bank that works in the interests of corporate elites, technically. Having a public bank is a fundamental, but having the correct public bank is absolutely necessary for this to be, a, to be legitimate and not just you know, window dressing. So at the end of the day, what we're working on now is creating a, an appropriate public bank charter. But let's, before that, everyone here is aware that LA City Council recently passed, introduced a motion to create a state chartered public bank. Is everyone aware mm, of that? No, so se not. So, uh, seven city council members um, introduced a, a motion to create a state chartered bank. It's Council President Wesson, uh, Chairman of the, the, bu the Budget and Finance Committee, Kokorian, Council Member Rue, Council Members uh, O'Farrell, Coretz, Bonin, and Cedillo. Right. So, seven out of 15 council members. Uh, so there's a majority right now towards the creation of a public bank. If you look at the motion, it predominantly addresses cannabis, the cannabis industry. Because that's where the money is. Because that's where the money is. So there's a bit of a feeding frenzy right now because in California, the projected sales for the cannabis industry is $7 billion. In Los Angeles, that it's a billion dollars in revenue, which would take Los Angeles out of the red. Um, in addition to that, the long-term, you know, the long-term financing uh, 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 benefits. They they see the benefit in, in public banking. It's just now it's a matter for the movement. Uh, the, the the goal for the movement now is to make sure that's not co-opted by private interests. Um, to make sure that 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 <coughs> bank is going to be chartered for the people, for the benefit, long-term benefit of the community, not long short-term profits for the city. Um, so the, ti the timing on this is absolutely critical now because now the public banking movement is starting to, to gain traction. That's a fact. We're not the only city do, uh, going for this. Other cities are as well. Uh, I believe. Uh, uh, Oakland. Yeah, Santa Oakland's, Rosa. Yeah, there's a, there's a quite a few. Seattle. Seattle's pushing San Francisco. for it. So it's it's starting to pick up now. Los Angeles is the first city council to actually officially start pushing uh, for this and, yeah. and starting to make the motions for this to happen. Timing is critical. Because if we don't get it right the first time, it's going to be a whole lot harder to go back and fix it after all the, uh, the fundamentals have been built than getting it right the first time. So the charter is not only for Los Angeles. What we want to do is we want to create a charter that, that represents kind of a nationwide movement where, where city after city after city kind of uses this, this wow. concept. So here's a, kind of a first draft ex, uh, excerpt of, of the types of things that we want the city to work on. Um, it's still being fleshed out the nuances of it and, and the you know feasibility on a deep financial level already will be included in this as well. But here's the basic guidelines for it. Is at the end of the day, all decisions that the bank makes have, have to be within a certain pro you know people environment framework. In other words, investments cannot be made. I'll go over everything. So so we want so part of the investment guidelines is that there will be responsibly controlled credit extension to prevent excessive debt and boom bust cycles. We don't want boom and bust. We want, we want sustainable growth. Um, we want to focus on long term stability and prosperity for all rather than short term quarterly profit focus. Uh, and we need to have it in the mission statement to continuously reduce poverty and spur general prosperity for the common good. A development of full ecological sustainability a focus on small local businesses and co-ops. In other words, to create a type of system where the smaller the business, the better the terms. If it's a co-op, you get better terms than if you're a big business to start to spur this type of uh, economy from the bottom up. Uh, we want a list of advocated investments, such as, as I said, co-ops. Uh, anything having to do with green energy would get good terms. Company, uh, or uh, the, the bank itself would have a maximum CEO to worker ratio. 
uh, a, lo uh, a local or organic agriculture, affordable housing, community land trusts, and affordable student loans. Although another part of the pillars we need to create is, I believe, free college, and hopefully that would be obsolete, but given the system we have for now, affordable uh, student loans. We also want a list of absolutely prohibited investments. No way that this bank will be allowed to invest in fossil fuels, uh, anything having to do with military industrial complex, any companies that have hidden overseas wealth, off limits. So basically we want to change the entire lever the way that the banking is leveraged to mm -hmm. work for the people. Uh, at the end of the day, this will be set up so that bankers are public servants. Uh, in other words, if they're they are found to have acted in any corrupt or in any way that is corrupt or that they have been shown to act in their own self-interest at the expense of the common good they can and will be fired there will be strict records and audits of meetings of all financials uh, in order to ensure that this is uh, appropriately enforced there will be strict resume requirements for the board members of this bank uh, board members would have to have uh, very, uh, demonstrable merit that reflects the aims and principles of this bank. In other words, their education and work experience must reflect the aims of this bank. So, for example, uh, if they are an economist and they're going to be a board member, they have to have shown a history uh, of advocacy and research into so, you know, social investments, green energy, and the like, so that the, the type of minds that are in this bank uh, are the types of minds that are for social good. Uh, at the end of the day, again, strong audit committee, uh, committee for, sol for total transparency, uh, whistleblower protection, uh, fair treatment of bank employees, and uh, at the end of the day, we also want to make sure that the bank is run very competently, so uh, a, a process of anti-nepotism and cronyism built into the, char into the charter as well uh, and into the mission statement. So that's the, that's the basics of how we want this bank to be constructed at all banks after we have the public bank revolution to come. So that's the, the gist of it. And we can open up the <laughs> questions. <laughs> right. So how does the uh, community make money? Is it public bank accountable? How is the public involved? Yeah, that's a good question. So at, at the end of the day, there will have to be a checks and balances type uh, system where there are independent third party auditing boards, perhaps uh, perhaps comprised of people that are uh, voted in. It would be probably a new uh, type of, uh, of elected official, mm -hmm. I believe, would be an appropriate way to do this so that people that are, can be voted in by the public will be able to uh, run the bank as public servants. Could the uh, neighborhood councils be Part of that? I believe that they should, absolutely. We're working with neighborhood councils. That's an ally themselves. right there. Yeah. I agree, yeah. We're working with neighborhood councils in order to get their input on this as well. So, sort of another component of, of accountability. When you mentioned that if there was an economist who did social and environmental work, how do you determine that that economist's uh, research was qualifies as that, and who, who would be determining that? Right. That's that, that is an excellent question. At the end of the day, you know, it always there, there's always going to be in, in these types of things somewhat of a subjective element, right? So that's what checks and balances are for. That's why having committees and third party committees are for. So you know, we we would have this is part of what we have to construct as we work with some of the smartest people in this field to develop the right criteria to ensure not only competence but you know good intentions for the common good. You know, it's hard to answer that question exactly and, and, you know, at this point because there's a lot of subjective nuance to it, but th that's definitely something that we're going to have to nail down as we, as we move forward. Do you intend to develop a model of a democratic leadership election? In other words, how are, is it, will a portion of the board of the bank be elected popularly or through some system, and will a portion of it be appointed as experts or something like that? I mean, do you have that model? Are you working up on, on a model like that? These are the types of details that are being worked on. Ah. I think it's absolutely imperative that you have public ac accountability. 
Uh, but you know, but it's also imperative because I also would be worried that somebody with a good smile and haircut sure can come in and dupe people into sure. you know voting him in, and then he does it in the corporate interests. So how do you protect democracy while protecting you know expertise and so on? So that's that's part of the the balance. And do you know if if this discussion of the idea of a public bank is being taken up in Richmond, uh, California, which has a uh, independent, not Democrat, not Republican, progressive city council now, and who faces Chevron every day as yeah. a huge power. Actually, so, I mean, I'm just wondering whether they are at all involved in these discussions. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I'm not quite aware at the at the up to date place that Richmond is, but I actually just spoke to Gail McLaughlin, which happens to be the former mayor of Richmond, right. Uh, right. and uh, she's very interested cool. in, in this okay. idea. And I'm sure she she can probably pull a few strings in that city council, uh, at least with a good word. Uh, after we we're gonna I'm gonna send her the, the uh, a finished charter and stuff. So. I think it would probably be worthwhile to speak to Steve Early too, who has has kind of chronicled the the uprising in. in Right. Thank you. Master. Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy. Any any connections that are relevant, we'd be more than happy to, to get this out to you. Uh, eventually, we, we don't want to jump the gun. Uh, we want to make sure that what we send out is mm -hmm. the completed version. Right now, I we're working. I'm working with people that are smarter than I am on, on banking to make sure that this charter is you know not only ideologically sound, which is kind of what we're injecting, but also you know financially sound and can work within the banking system in a way where we, when we give it to a city council, the, the financial heads there can say, okay, this is legitimate and not some pie in the sky thing. We can actually make, really make it work. So that's what we're doing <clears> on that. And once that's complete, we'll blast it out to everybody. Cool. I have a question about um, how a public bank in Los Angeles would exist within the current legislative framework that governs banks and specifically about what you were mentioning about uh, stopping boom bust cycles mm -hmm. and then and uh, you know, while still favoring competition, mm -hmm. like how, how would how do you envision that working? Like without the public bank being possibly accused of collusion or right. something, you know, like mm -hmm. yeah. That's a really good point. Actually, uh, one of my mentors on this, who is the one of the public banking gurus, uh, brought a very similar concern up. Like, how do you say, okay, well. This has to invest in green energy. It's like, well, okay, then how do you prevent it from just picking winners and right. picking a company that's maybe not the best, but they're green energy, so you give them money anyways, and then they go under and you lose money. Like, you know, there's the there's the, the those factors. So I think you have to uh, create a balance uh, of multiple factors. So you have the ideological factor and and the you know the social good factor, and then it has to be tempered by sound financial decisions. So I think that you kind of have a, a weighting system where, you know, at the end of the day, you have the prohibited investments, and then out of the green energy companies, then they can compete for financial soundness within the the good, you know, the good ideological framework. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so far, there haven't been any city public banks. Mm -hmm. That's that's right in America, at least. This is would be the first. And so, is the North Dakota State Bank? That's like that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's a state bank. That's the one. It's, you know, and Los Angeles is a bigger economy than North Dakota. Profit <laughs> in the last 12 years, it's more profitable than Goldman Sachs. You right. know, it's right. you know, cities are looking at this and saying, "Wow, you know, why aren't we doing this?" And have you guys are, are you able to look at their model at all? Yeah, uh, actually, this is part of what inspired the concept of creating the charter, right? Because right. Uh, the Bank of North Dakota is public, but they invest in oil. All right, so it's well, that kind of goes to what I said before. It's not enough to only be public. It has to be public and then constructed in the right way. Uh, but they do provide a really good, uh, an excellent argument that we can even make to uh, you know, fiscal conservatives, right? Uh, there, incidentally, are great arguments we can make to them. You know, because here's a fact. We paid $100 million in Los Angeles to fees to Wall Street. When we want to build a bridge or a road or, you know, or a school, whatever, we have to buy bonds. Then we have to pay those bonds back plus interest. The, the interest and fees on those have to actually go back to Wall that goes to Wall Street. It's extractive. So our tax dollars, a portion of that gets funneled into the bankers' pockets. So we could argue, well, those are your tax dollars you worked for them, keep them in, in the community. There's the fiscal argument. You could also say, uh, you know, local determination. A lot of conservatives like that language too. So I think in, in some interesting ways you can create uh, good arguments and also the fact that, that the Bank of North Dakota is more profitable than many private banks. 
Not mm -hmm. to mention the fact of the expenses of uh, litigation that c come against right. Wall Street banks. For, exactly. Uh, it's yeah. actually the most profitable bank in the U.S. Is it? Well, yeah, uh, if, Ralph, if, Ralph Nader thinks yeah. that. If not one of them, if not the top, one of them. Yeah. Um, who, um, would, it, would uh, private parties be able to be depositors in this bank? Right, so that's a good question. And there, there's really two kind of, kind of categories of banks to look at, right? So you have the retail banks, which is where you know you go in as an individual or a company and you put your money in and you pull the money out of an ATM. There's retail banking, uh, and then you have like investment banking, the bank that sells the bonds to the city. You know, um, at the at the fundamental level, you have the investment banking aspect, which is just the bank that provides, you know, the accounts for the city as a whole, but individuals and companies wouldn't really interact with it. Um, that, at, at, to me, would be the minimum thing we want to go for. The ideal would also be to have a type of bank that does interact with other banks as well. One of the arguments that has been brought forth, which we do have to play devil's advocate and address, is, well, what about the mom and pop banks? You know, you're going to push them out of business. Um, <laughs> the Bank of North Dakota, actually, incidentally, does happen to work with other right. local banks. Mm -hmm. so it's they, not a competition again. Yeah. It's not a competition, they work with them. And as a matter of fact, um, I do believe that in North Dakota you can, uh, they don't even have branches, they just have a single office, but you can go to like your local bank and, mm -hmm. and, and the services through the Bank of North Dakota can interact with them. So they actually work in tandem with them as opposed to competing with them. So retail banks take depositors, investment banks don't? Yeah, investment banks are investment banks. So they're the, they're the banks that are gonna sell the bonds to the city. So in other words, if it, it, the, the Bank of Los Angeles would be technically the city of Los Angeles, it would be a DBA doing business as the Bank of Los Angeles or the People's Bank of Los Angeles. Um, the People's Bank of Los Angeles would, would extend that credit, loan the money out to the city itself. So it's the city loaning money to itself essentially. Then what it, let's say 4% interest on a bond the, the city pays that interest back to itself, so the profit is you know, circulated back into itself, and then that profit can be back reinvested back into the city rather than some banker in Manhattan's fourth yacht. You know? <laughs> so where's the optimism coming from? It's the fact that all these cannabis businesses don't have any place to put yeah. their money? Yep. So uh, that's, that's creating tailwinds. So yeah, sure. yeah, exactly. And, and so, 2016 voters in California passed Prop 64, which legalized marijuana usage. But you know, in the in the in the state of California, marijuana is still a federal schedule Schedule One right. drugs, which means these financial institutions don't allow them to put their money oh, in. Really? So you've got a right. billion dollars in LA, seven billion dollars in sitting around. And sitting around in California. So that's, so that's why the state treasurer, John Chang, created a cannabis banking working group. So he just had a meeting um, a few weeks ago to with, with all the major heads in the, in the cannabis industry, with major financial industry experts on there, to figure out a way to, to have these cannabis businesses enter commerce and, and get their money banking legally so our own state treasurer is pushing for this and that's why you know all of these cities in California are now pushing towards public banking because state treasurer John Chang actually divested also divested uh, California from Wells Fargo mm -hmm. for a year you really have to capture the public imagination mm -hmm. I would think because the Chevron money is just mm -hmm. overwhelmingly just gonna crush this idea I would think mm -hmm. I mean I'm not trying to throw cold water, but I'm just wondering. Like, well, I would say that they're going to crush. They're going to try to crush, yeah. and they're going to fight back, and they're going to lose. Yeah. That's how we're, that's how we're okay. looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's not be cynical. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, we need to confront the yeah. forces, obviously. Yeah. You know. So going, going back to the marijuana industry, what, how, like, what, is, what measures has John Chang or uh, whoever in his place put in place to uh, check money laundering since it's such a gray business, you know? Right? Well, I think that this is exactly why that he's starting to publicly push for this and he's an ally on this. I, I think, again, I, just to address that, it's really important that we, we control the narrative now. Yeah. Because the marijuana thing is like, okay, that's a, those are nice tailwinds and it's providing kind of lobbying and support from a separate party that, you know, cool, you know. But public good, environmental, you know, security, we have to keep the focus on the real thing because we can have a public bank and corporate interest and marijuana is big money. We have to have 
the right progressive attitude behind this as well. So we have to keep on pushing that narrative. Yeah, we have to realize that you know quite a few lobbyists in, in the marijuana business came from Goldman Sachs. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's mm -hmm. the money. Yeah. yeah. Well, not only that, but uh, we have a attorney general that might be able to step on it really easily. Yeah. That's why we have to create the people power, and that's why the Citibank revolution is so powerful because, as I said, the City Hall is a lot easier to access than the State Assembly or, or the U.S. Senate. So the more local you go, the more accessible it becomes. Who's leading the fight in the City Council? Besides these seven who have signed on, any one of them? Bonin, maybe? Or? Uh, well, it was it's, it's, the main sponsors are Wesson, Kokorian, and Rue. And Wesson Kerkorian, or I mean, Wesson is, is council president, and, yeah. and Kerkorian is the chairman of the Budget and Finance Committee, so those are your two most powerful allies already. Okay. So, you know, the fact that they're pushing this is, is pretty major. We just have to make sure the, the narrative and the charter is very what's strong. The, uh, what's the schedule? What's the next move? Um, so right now, they are, so they introduced the motion. Um, what we're trying to do is create kind of an educational campaign to help how to help these city council members understand what needs to be in the charter. So we want, you know, Ellen Brown and Mark Armstrong and all those experts to sit down with them because if you read that motion, you know, it's very heavy, cannabis heavy. And so this needs to be, you know, uh, we need to broaden the, the conversation um, and we need to make sure that it's, it's got a strong charter. And so um, the next step would be to for, for us to go in and citizens lobbying. Um, they're, it, uh, the, they're expecting that the motion will get pushed through a, a jobs committee. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're actually looking into what that is. Our strongest allies, <laughs> while, while you know, Wesson and the like are, are gonna be strong because you know, they're pushing for it and they have the most power. Mm -hmm. They're kind of pushing for the public banking option as a general whole without all the, the, you know, the details of social good and all the charter mm -hmm. stuff I talked yeah. about, our strongest allies are probably going to be uh, uh, Coretz and Bonin, and who happen to be the most Corian, which are, are the, the, the sponsors of the divestment. They're the ones that are going to be most likely to sit down with us, or their, right. their staff members are, and we can really we'll break down the, the charter to them so that they can start pushing for not only a public bank, but the correct public bank. Which is and who is, the, who is the lead person in the marijuana industry here? There's got to be one. At least one. Here in Los Angeles? Yeah, that's your, that's your ally. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's quite a few lobbyists here. Um, you know, there was, the, uh, John Chang just had his cannabis banking working group at, at the uh, hotel, at the Sheridan Hotel a few weeks ago, and there were a few there. Um, so, I mean, that's our next conversation once we get the charter down is to, to get some of those allies on board because, again, you know, they're pushing for one specific narrative just sure. to get the, the marijuana money in. Sure. So, you know, if we can help have them help us, you know, push this bank and, and, you know, work as allies together, that's great. If they want to kind of kind of broaden their, their narrative when they're, at, when they're lobbying, that would be great. Well, logical. Um, so what's the next step? Finish the charter and get it. You know, we we need to have a first pass by uh, by the board member, our board members, Ellen Brown, Mark Armstrong, those guys, and also uh, Tom. Yeah. Are there are they members of the board? Is there a board public for bank. the public bank? That's the, the member public of the bank. Board. Board. Is there a the is this on here somewhere? But uh, that would be quite a question. Sure. Any other questions? Oh yeah. So that group is writing the the charter. The board and you I'm working with them directly. You know, I kind of created the first draft, and they're kind of helping to proofread it and refine it. Uh, yeah. Tom, uh, I'll, I'll send the links out if you guys want to see it, uh, or I'll send it to one of you to share it out. Uh, Ellen Brown wrote the book, literally wrote the book, The Public Bank Solution. Um, Mark Armstrong is extremely knowledgeable. He's been a mentor to me on um, on banking. Uh, he, he's the head of a group called Commonomics, which uh, I'm sure all of you would be in tune with everything that they're trying to do. And another gentleman, Tom Zguros, uh, has, uh, he also wrote another book on how to improve banks so that they work in the name of the people. He knows, he knows the business of banking like nobody else, but he's on the right ideological side. 
So he's going to be able to provide a lot of the nuanced, you know, financials uh, for this as well. So, so we have a really good board. Yeah. So the next step for us is once we finalize that uh, that public banking charter, we're going to hold a meeting to mobilize the movement behind those talking points, so that everyone can get in there and start citizen lobbying and say this is what we want. And, okay. and then we fight. <laughs> we have time for like we have probably like five more minutes for questions, so maybe like one or two more. I ask sort of an abstract question. Would you say a public bank is, is an anti-capitalist entity? Well, at the end of the day, you know, I think money is neither good nor evil in and of itself. It's just an energy. And how that money is used uh, what is what determines whether it's good or evil. Uh, yeah. So because banking is kind of a heartbeat of where the money flows and how it flows, if you construct the bank in a pro-people, in a pro-environment yeah. way, then you can use the energy and the power of this neutral concept of money to be pushed towards creating a better society. So yeah. I would say that it would, it's, it's a way to use profits to, or, or to create profits that everybody benefits off of. Right. It's, it's sort of enigmatic because you can, you can kind of sell it to a leftist as anti-capitalists and at the same time sell it to exactly. a conservative as you know, an investment opportunity. Yeah. Which is so fascinating. It's in a way, it's, I think it's almost transcended dialectically of the old <laughs> capitalist-communist <laughs> dichotomy uh, into I a way so. that is, you know, some people have called it social capitalism where everybody profits <laughs> as a whole. I think it's the same it's in the same uh, branch, if you will, as cooperatives. You know, there are right wing like you know, Republicans who love the idea of cooperatives because it's you know small business that helps local communities. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So you just yeah. have to frame the right narrative depending on who you're selling it yeah. to. <laughs> so is there a mailing list that you would like suggest folks any interested folks to sign up? For that SLA and for public bank. Yeah, LA. let's. Uh, if if you want to, I'll start a sheet. Um, we have a Google Groups that we started, and uh, they'll start getting active soon. As soon as we uh, put the finishing touches on that charter. So, if you want to sign up for that, we'll keep you updated on the next meeting, um, and that's going to start the movement. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have. I mean, we have meetings uh, fairly often. Um, they will include. We hit, we hit it from all directions. So once we have the charter down, the narrative down to a T, uh, it's gonna be about activating the people to hit City Hall uh, to demand that they create the right public bank. So we do phone banking. Uh, we're gonna have a workshop on public banking. Everything I've discussed today, kind of in a more official workshop setting, um, things like that. So uh, if you stay tuned on, on Public Bank LA on Facebook, on our Meetup Group Revolution LA, uh, then those things will provide all the dates. Two other things. Uh, one, I wonder if technology will will need to play a part in this. Yeah. Uh, it's something that we kind of brought up earlier is that I think a lot of people choose Chase or Citibank, you know, over a credit union because their their apps are useful. Right. With things like taking pictures of checks to make deposits. Right. So I wonder if if that can even come up in in, in the discussion. Yeah. So so that's a really interesting point. Is is you know some of the apologists of you know free markets will say, well, look how efficient the free market right. is. Look at all the good technology and right. look at the DMV, right? Like you know that that's the kind of the argument. The my, <laughs> right. You know, people are anti-public sector. My my view on that is, you know, the key is to create a better public sector, right? So, you know, I think that ha that hiring the smart people into public sector, creating an efficient public sector that doesn't waste money but that uses the money effectively for the common good, right. right? Getting the innovators in the public sector to create those types of systems for the public bank to make it flashy and nice and smooth and efficient right. is, the is the best of both worlds. Yeah. But, but I think, I, I think just, just to piggyback on that, I think there are plenty of examples of, of private companies having taken over public utilities exactly. that have run right. far worse than the public utilities. That is that true. Right. I'm talking about the narrative, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> the yeah. propaganda. I mean, Right. Plenty of examples. You're, exa you're exactly right. Of course. So it'd be great if you could find, you know, the right people in Silicon Beach, as it's called, to maybe hop yeah, on the board. Public sector for the public sector. Or just some dude in the basement. Don't bother with well, them. That's, <laughs> that's me. Yeah. I'm a web developer, but I yeah. can't do, you know, anything by myself. Some rich dude in a basement. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you got to find yeah. it. But it's only going to be investment banking. So. That's true. That's true. 
Oh, and one other thought was the, the Olympics. Uh, I wonder if that can be some sort of milestone or, you know, where they're going to put the, the money that oh, the city yeah. gets. Point. You got like you just don't the rest. Want to support the Olympics, do you? Well, that's <laughs> yeah. that's true, actually. I mean, right? What do you think about? <laughs> you don't have to be on camera. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, 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 don't do that right now. Yeah. <laughs> Cut that piece out. Yeah. <laughs> no, I. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to just kind of paint this picture, which I talked about in my speech, which is. Just imagine if a domino effect happens, if like LA, New York, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they all start creating their own city public banks and then all 50 states create their own public banks. Literally, you don't need a revolution where Washington nationalizes Wall Street. It's not going to happen that way, right? You, you, it's going to pull the carpet out from under them and then move the money into Main Street and then it's just going to make Wall Street obsolete eventually. So that's kind of the solution that, we, that we'd like to, the picture we'd like to paint for everybody is. Just imagine this spreading like wildfire. We want to inspire activists in every city and every state to follow suit, and then it's going to change the game. I'd like to shift the emphasis slightly. Rather than being against Wall Street, be for the better future that yeah. we can Absolutely. create because yeah. we have yeah. local control. That's exactly what it is. Wall Street's just an after effect. It's like, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if it, if it does well because it changes, great. If not, whatever. But we have our own. That's our yeah. tagline is banking for 100%, not the 1%. Okay. Okay. For all society. All right. I think that's uh, probably it. We gotta wrap up. But um, thank you, Phoenix. Thank My you, Shane, for coming.